didn't I just put out a video saying how great I thought 2.5 gallon stovetop batches were? Well, how come I'm brewing a 5 gallon batch? Welcome back. This is Brent from Cascades Homebrew. So, yeah, I brew a, a mix of batches. I love the 2.5 gallon stovetop batches. I'm often brewing 5 gallon batches that I'll split into two, two different yeasts. I love doing the, the one gallon, the three quarter gallon type batches just to try out some new hops, some new grain, or some new process, something, something a little different. Well, in this video, I'm just straight up brewing five gallons of beer. I'm gonna try five and a half gallons into a fermenter to get five gallons into a single keg. I'll go on a recent quest just to learn more about Saisons, to brew some and try to come up with a house recipe. And I also acquired some malt from Murphy and Rude Maltster. So I have 12 and a half pounds of their Pilsner. I figured it'd be a great opportunity for a five gallon batch using that and some other malts from them. And then I also have enough left over to do a small one gallon trial batch with their, using uh, just their Pilsner malt. So I figured that uh, brewing a five gallon batch today one would be a, a great way to put some of the stuff I've learned brewing Pilsner to use. Two, a great way to use the Murphy and Rude malt. Uh, three, it may help me with my problem of why I've been drinking my two and a half gallon kegs of Saison so quickly before they ever get a chance to uh, age into maturity. So I'm also optimistic that soon I'll be able to gather with friends and maybe have friends over, help them drink beer, maybe bring beer to club meetings. So the extra volume is going to help with that. So I figured brewing a five gallon batch would be a great chance for me to go ahead and break out the camera and give you some insight into my process and my equipment for brewing five gallon batches, brewing the bag style. I sure hope the weather cooperates. This is the area that I use for brewing five gallon batches. It's a patio on my lower level underneath my deck. I put some effort last fall into fixing this area up a little bit, uh, including some furniture and some plantings. And I'm looking forward to it coming to life in spring. Uh, I use a propane burner I purchased at Home Depot many years ago. I have a good quality but basic 10 gallon kettle that I've also had for many years, but it still looks great. Uh, attached to the upper deck, I have an eyelet for my ratcheting pulley to attach my brew in the bag. Let's get this brew day started and see how long it takes us. This particular batch requires 7.8 gallons of water. Uh, so this is a pretty typical amount for my batches for a mid-gravity beer with a 60 minute boil. So the actual amount of water would vary a little bit from batch to batch based on say the amount of grain. So more grain, it's gonna absorb more water. Uh, boil length, sometimes I do 30 minute boils, which is less water. If I'm doing a uh, longer two hour plus boil, I would need uh, more water. Um, Losses to hops, so for big hoppy beers, I'll often adjust my losses in the uh, recipe to account for those losses, which will require a little more water up front. So here I'm using an RV hose, and then I have a uh, dipstick that's marked out that helps me get close on water volumes. So yeah, you know, a kettle with, with accurate markings would, would be nice, but you know, this, this has been working for me fine. Note that this water volume is to target 5.5 gallons into the fermenter. Time to fire up the burner. While the mash water heats up, it's time for me to measure out my additions. This particular batch requires eight grams of gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, one half of a crushed up Campton tablet, which is to remove chlorine and chloramine, 27 milliliters of 10% phosphoric acid, which is to lower the mash pH and overall beer pH. Uh, calcium chloride is also a common addition, but it's not needed for this batch. I will occasionally use Epsom salt, which is a magnesium sulfate. For dark beers with about 15% or more roasted malts, I may need to use a baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate, to raise the pH of the beer. I go ahead and stir my water additions into the heating mash water. Next, I measure out my grain. For this saison, I'm using malts from Murphy & Rood. Murphy & Rood is a craft maltster located in Charlottesville, Virginia. This is my first time using their malts and I'm excited to give them a try. I measure out uh, 10 and a half pounds of Pilsner, one and a half pounds of rye malt, half a pound of biscuit malt. This grain bill is very similar to my last th three saison batches. So those batches were all a Wireman Pils uh, base malt along with rye and cane sugar. So I removed the sugar as I don't think it's really needed in what I'm looking for in a saison. 
Uh, I added in some biscuit malt just to give a little bit of complexity. I might have wanted Munich instead, uh, but I didn't purchase any from uh, Murphy and Rude, so I went with the uh, biscuit malt, which should give a nice touch of flavor. I milled the grain with my trusty old barley crusher. It's probably due for a replacement after milling lots of grain. I was sick of the keyless chuck on my uh, drill, which kept slipping, so recently I swapped it out for this inexpensive keyed chuck from Harbor Freight. It does provide a pretty firm grip, but it sure wobbles a lot. I reached my strike water temp, so it's time to put my brew bag in and add the grain. I try to add the grain slowly, stirring in it as I go. This helps reduce dough balls and ensures all the grain is wet. I tried using this measuring cup, eh, but then I just resorted to my standard process of holding the bucket under one arm. This seems to work a little better for me. I mix in the grain well and verify my mash temperature. I have a long stem thermometer that I really like, but I don't fully trust its accuracy as it's gotten knocked out of alignment in the past. So I use this inexpensive lab thermometer at the beginning of the mash to check my temperature, and then I use it to verify my long stem thermometer. Uh, a few degrees here or there won't impact the overall character of the beer much, uh, but I do like to at least know my mash temperature and record it on my sheet. During the mash, I wrap up my kettle in the sleeping bag. I picked this up for maybe 25 bucks at Walmart. It works much better than I had expected as it holds my mash temperatures one, maybe two degrees Fahrenheit over a one hour mash. For this particular batch, I'm mashing at a lower temp, so I go ahead and mash for 90 minutes. My notes say I only lost two degrees Fahrenheit, so it dropped from 148 Fahrenheit to 146 Fahrenheit. I use Beersmith Mobile for my recipes, so I go ahead and start my 90 minute mash timer. My last couple batches have been 2.5 gallon batches that I brewed upstairs in my kitchen. So I took advantage of the long mash time to get caught up on a little overdue cleaning down here in my lower level. Around the 30 minute, I give the mash a good stir. I also grab a sample for a pH reading. I'm not sure how much confidence I have in my inexpensive two year old pH meter, but I measured a pH of 5.45. That's pretty close to what I was wanting it to be. I've had this floating dairy thermometer for years. I saw an online post from somebody saying how they like theirs, so I broke mine out to give it a try. Eh, the scale is hard to read and it seems to be off several degrees, so I ended up just throwing it away here recently. The 30 minute mash is complete, so I went ahead and took off the sleeping bag. I give the mash a good stir, and I also record my final mash temperature. I usually just use this lab thermometer to verify that my long stem thermometer is calibrated. And I guess with the lower mash temperatures of the batch today, I wanted just to make sure I was on target. So I used it through the whole thing. Time to put my ratcheting pulley to work. I will do a little squeezing of the grain bag, but I try to let gravity do most of the work for me. So I hoist up the bag and let it drain while the wort heats up to boiling temps. At that time, I will do a quick check of my volume and my gravity just to make sure I'm on target. I can make some slight tweaks now if I, for some reason, I'm too far off. Uh, but with a, you know, with a low to mid-gravity beer like this one, I'm usually pretty close. I took a gravity reading with my refractometer showing that I was on target, so that's a good thing. So as the wort was heating to a boil, it's time to get my hops measured out. Citra and Saison. I recently made a, a couple batches of Saison, one with Citra, one with Herzberger, and I kind of like the character that the Citra added. So Citra for flavoring and aroma, and this batch gets some Northern Brewer for my bittering hops. Here I am trying to show my refractometer reading to the camera. It's a little bit of a struggle for me. I register 12 bricks, which I translate over to a specific gravity of 1.049. I don't really trust the specific gravity scale on this device because it seems off, which right now it's showing 1.45, which is about four points lower. So I use a conversion tool in Beersmith. With that out of the way, it's time to get this batch up to boiling. And so I add my hops just before the boil starts. I'm nearing the end of the boil. So I add one ounce of Citra along with Warflock tablet and yeast nutrient. The Warflock tablet helps to clear the wort and settle out proteins. The yeast nutrient is probably not critical, but I have some, so I figure it won't hurt, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. Uh, at this point, the sky is darkening, and I hear some rumbling in the distance. Uh, that's one of the dangers of brewing outdoors, the weather. Uh, one day I might add a cover over this area, or set up a brew area in my garage. End of the boil, so I add the last one ounce of Citra. 
I usually take a gravity and volume measurement here, but with the weather turning for the worse and the filming, I guess I just forgot. Sometimes I put my immersion chiller in my bucket of star sand, and sometimes I just add it to the wart at flame out to sanitize. Uh, today I just used the star sand bucket. I used to have just this 20 foot chiller that I made from soft copper. Then I acquired a nicer 25 foot chiller. So I stretched out my DIY chiller coil so they fit around the outside of the nicer chiller and then I connect them and run them in serial. I had tried at one point using a splitter then running them in parallel. It might have chilled a little faster but it used a lot more water so I'm pretty happy with this setup. I will usually stir the wort continuously while the water runs through the immersion chiller. I find I can drop off the majority of the heat in about 10 minutes. Depending on how cold my tap water is, I might be able to get down to pitching temps in say 15 minutes, but I'll often just use my fermentation chamber to finish off the last 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. I collect hot water in a few buckets and use that water for washing and rinsing my equipment. On this particular day, I had to change plans and I moved the kettle inside to chill. I continue the chilling inside using the hose adapter on my utility sink. This is where I used to chill my batches before I realized just how bad of an idea it was to carry six gallons of near boiling wort to the other side of the house. Once the wort started to chill, everything that touches the wort must be clean and sanitized. This is very important. Star sand is my sanitizer of choice these days. I usually mix up a batch of star sand when I need to purge a keg, and then I'll keep that in a bucket and use it for a month or so. I also keep a spray bottle of star sand handy. Over the years, I've used different methods of transferring the wort into the fermenter. This is where a ball valve in my kettle sure would be handy. For many years, I just let the wort settle for a bit while I started to clean up my equipment. Then I would use an auto siphon, leaving the worst of the break and hot matter in the kettle. Lately, I've been using this funnel and a strainer. The setup works a little better for my smaller batches as a kettle with five and a half gallons of wort can be a little heavy and awkward. It does a decent job of filtering out hot matter and maximizing the amount of finished beer. One downside is that I end up with a little more trub in the bottom of my fermenter, but that's fine with me. I don't think there's really much impact of trub versus no trub. If the hops clog up the filter, which it often does if I have more than a couple ounces of hops, I have to pause and then dump out the hop matter from the filter and then get back to pouring. With the wort transferred into the fermenter, I add the lid and cover the stopper with foil. I will then move the fermenter into my fermentation chamber. I attach the inkbird controller probe to the side of the fermenter. So I have a seedling mat or a small space heater that I can use as a heat source. I went ahead and set the controller to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The beer is currently at 76 degrees Fahrenheit, so I will wait to pitch the yeast for a little bit. At this point, I'm 4 hours and 20 minutes into the brew day. Not too bad, with a 90 minute mash and a 60 minute boil, plus a little slowdown from the filming and juggling around the weather. I still need to come back and pitch the yeast and clean up some equipment. I take a gravity reading with the sample that I have cooled. The wort is sure a pretty looking color, so I'm happy about that. At this point, I notice I'm a little high on gravity and a little low on volume. And I'd kind of noticed that my boil was a little more vigorous than it should be, but I guess I was distracted and did not adjust it. I end up coming back later and topping up the fermenter with just under half a gallon of distilled water, which gets my actual gravity just about to my target. I figure I'd rather have the full five gallons of beer than have less beer that's more alcoholic. The wort has cooled to pitching temps and all my equipment is cleaned up. I'm using the DuPont Saison strain for this batch, which is WLP565. I'm pitching yeast harvested from my prior batch. This jar of harvested yeast is just about four weeks old. I've had excellent results direct pitching about a 16 ounce jar of harvested yeast slurry, as long as I do so in around four weeks. Any longer, and I probably need to think about making a starter. I made sure to sanitize the lid and rim of the jar before adding it. I'm going to wrap up this video here with some soothing video of happy yeast. This scene is from the day after brew day, so that harvested yeast really did take off. My goal of this video was not to showcase a specific recipe, but instead just provide an overall view of my brew day equipment and process for brewing five gallon all grain brew in the bag batches. The downpour threw me a little curve. Also, I'm usually pretty good about hitting my target volume and gravity, 
though my efficiency was pretty much on target, so I was able to correct. I may put out some content talking about my quest to brew a great saison that would cover the tasting of this batch. I also plan to put content out focused on fermenting and kegging process. I hope you enjoyed this video. Go ahead and subscribe if you want notification of future content, and feel free to leave any feedback or questions you have in the comment section. So now get out there and build some great beer.